You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you very much for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Uh, Before I get to today's episode, I just want to mention a few quick things. Uh, Number one is National Screenwriters Day is coming up January the 5th of 2017. So January uh, this upcoming year. And it's all going to be about uh, screenwriters. So uh, this is being put on by Screenwriting You and Stage Thirty Two, just you know, as a couple of the sponsors. And it's going to be a whole day of celebration of of talking and discussing about screenwriting. So make sure you click on that link, and that will take you to the website, and you can find out uh, what's actually going on that day. There's more things being added piece by piece. And I think it's going to be really, really cool. So this is a great time if you ever were wondering about screenwriting, or maybe you were looking to to form a screenwriting group or maybe you just want to get better at screenwriting, this is going to be a date you want to circle. So that's, again, that's January the 5th of 2017. Also, uh, my class on Skillshare. It, again, you can get that class plus unlimited other classes for three months for only 99 cents. I just took a class uh, by Gary Vaynerchuk on all about social media. There's uh, so many other great classes, so many other things to learn on that on that uh, that website. And again, three months for only 99 cents. Again, there's a link in the show notes at DaveBullis.com. And finally, I'm starting a private Facebook group all about, well, not only about this podcast, but but also about filmmaking. If you're interested in, in joining a group that's a lot different than the ones out there, you're not going to get beat over the head with crowdfunding campaigns. You're not going to get beat over the head with with you know people just constantly posting, "Hey, buy my movie, buy my movie." This is going to be a Facebook group that has a lot more structure and rules to it, uh, you know, a lot more purpose to it. So if you're interested, message me. I'll add you to it, and it's going to be a secret group. So I'm going to vet everybody that goes into it. So again, we're going to avoid that whole constant marketing, constant you know promotion that that kills a lot of these other groups. So, on to this week's episode of the podcast. My next guest is one of the reasons why I actually started this podcast. I literally made so many notes for this interview. I I wanted to talk about so many things. I didn't even know where to start. And I hope this all comes out well. Uh, You know, my next guest is a multi number one Amazon bestseller and hosts one of the top podcasts in the world. This is episode 141 with guest James Altucher. Hey, James, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Dave, thank you so much for asking me to come on the show. I'm really grateful. You know, James, uh, you've been a mentor of mine for years now, ever since I've heard of you, like around 2010, I think I, I heard of you around then uh, for your article about how much of a scam college is. And um, by the way, when I read it, I was like, this guy's 100% right. And, um, you know, uh, from there, everything that you published, everything that, you know, I have all of your books, everything. So and, and also, I, you, basically, you've been an indirect mentor for me this whole time. Well, thanks very much, Dave. Yeah, that, that college article, I got a lot of backlash on. Uh, and even lost friends over it, but but I still believe it. Like you know, and now we're seeing the outcomes, which is that you know most people are graduating and taking jobs that don't even require a college degree. And you have people even like Google saying they're no longer looking at whether or not someone has a college degree. So I think gradually, what used to be controversial is now being a legitimate discussion. So so I'm glad uh, that's happening. Yeah, because I actually knew a guy who was a headhunter for Google, and he said what they were doing now was they were looking at kids in high school because with the you know we're in the information age, so he said by the time they're in high school, they're most likely nine times out of ten, or maybe even ten times out of ten, they're already online learning this stuff, and they already know what they're going to do. And some of these kids are geniuses at artificial intelligence. The other these other kids are geniuses at coding, and they don't need college because they 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 already know at that age they already know more than the most teachers do. Well, the thing is, too, college is te- – and this is not always the case, so I'm not, I'm not throwing like a thousand colleges into one basket. But college is teaching kind of slightly older 
knowledge, like something that's already been put into a textbook. Now, normally that might be a good thing because it's knowledge that's been studied and curated and thought about and experimented on and so on. But technology is changing so fast right now and opportunities and innovations happening so fast. Like I just saw a help wanted ad the other day for a self-driving car engineer. In other words, an engineer who specializes in self-driving cars. Well, there's no degree in college that teaches that because self-driving cars on the road didn't even exist a year ago. So, so things are just happening too fast. And, and what, 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 what you need now is to develop skills and not necessarily a paper certificate. And there are many, many ways to develop skills, college being one, maybe not even the best of them. Yeah, which is another reason why I started this podcast was uh, one, I was inspired by by you, and two, uh, because this is basically like a film school. You know, each week, you know, the way I I always tell people to think of this podcast is each week it's like having a different instructor come in, and you know, I'm always the same, but you know, I'm always talking to a new person who's actually out there doing stuff, who's you know, like yourself, who's worked at HBO, uh, like other people who's who's come in and they've they've done their own indie films, or other people who've who's come in and. Like they, I, I had uh, Alex Dinelaris on here who who uh, wrote Birdman. And he won an Academy Award, so wow. it's like, yeah. How'd so you get it, him on? that's a great get. Uh, I actually reached out to him through Facebook, and uh, I we had a couple mutual friends, and I said, trust me, I'm not I'm not crazy or anything. And uh, <laughs> but he he you know, we got to talking, and he said, yeah. And uh, I've had you know I've had the writer of John Wick on here. Um, I've had I've had so many great guests on here, James. I've been so very fortunate. But that 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 I want this to be like a a offshoot free film school for people. That is so great. Are you, uh, I, I don't even know, are you heavily involved in, in film? Like, is that a passion of yours? Uh, yes, I am. I, I, I love writing, and uh, so I'm build, real big into screenwriting, and then I also like doing filmmaking as well. Have you um, uh, worked in any uh, screenplays? Oh, uh, yes, I have, actually. Like, screenplays that, uh, like, that were produced, or are you working on one and trying to get it bought, or what's your, what's your goal? Well, I've actually done both. Uh, so, so as far as screenplays getting produced, I've produced everything that a- anything that I wanted to do. I sort of produced. Uh, for instance, in 2010, actually, I actually wrote and directed and produced my own TV pilot. Uh, I got to. I was the first person to shoot at this brand new soundstage here in Philly. Uh, right after me, uh, the production that came in was After Earth with Will Smith and M Night Shyamalan. Uh, so I took this TV pilot. We got to, I pitched it to NBC and then I pitched it to G4 right before they closed. And, uh, the guys at G4 were like, this is amazing. This is exactly what we would, we would have bought and had on this, had on this network, but we're, but we're going out of business. So unfortunately, uh, we can't buy anything, but still, you know, that's great because you keep doing stuff like that and, and persistence wins persistence plus love equals accomplishment is what I always feel. Yeah, and uh, again, because I, I always read your blogs, and and you know, especially about writing and creativity. Um, but you know, actually, James, I wanted to ask a lot about your background, and, and you know, uh, again, I, I touched on it briefly about HBO. But you know, how did you find you know, as you were sort of you got out of college? I think you went to Yale, I think, and no, no, uh, I, uh, I went to Cornell. Oh, Cornell, I'm sorry. And so after you got out of college, you landed a job at HBO in their IT department. So how, how did you land a job there? Well, I uh, was thrown out of school, actually. I was studying um, artificial intelligence. And even back then, in the early 90s, I was studying virtual reality. And uh, I pitched uh, HBO on this idea that I wanted them to fund uh, uh, about, about kind of virtual reality and storytelling and virtual reality. And they said, no, it's a little not advanced enough for us because back then, you know, VR was, was not like it is today. And, but they said, anytime you want, uh, come to, come work for us, you know, leave, leave the academic world and come work for us. And so I didn't think I was qualified enough. I felt like, oh, I need to like write a novel or something before I'm cool enough to work at HBO. Like I loved HBO. I loved all the shows on HBO, everything. And it took two years before I, uh, so to speak, chose myself and said, you know what? I don't need to write a novel. I'm good enough to work at HBO. They already asked me two years ago. And so I started working there about two years later. 
and you so where did you actually pitch them the idea for for your TV show which I think is brilliant by the way uh 3 a.m. uh the TV show is called 3 a.m. for those of you who who don't know uh and James basically would go around outside and talk to people at 3 a.m. in the morning so James how, how did you actually end up pitching that show to them well what happened was um I uh uh I started first off they didn't realize they needed a website. Like this was back in 1994, 1995. Nobody knew, no corporations realized at that time that they actually needed a website because the web was relatively uh, young and not that many people were on it. And I convinced them they needed a website and that's a, a whole story because at first they really resisted. And then I was in charge of creating the website. So I went up to the CEO, who's now the CEO of Time Warner, and I said, look, HBO is really great at – original TV programming. This is how HBO was making their, their brand. And, you know, HBO was the first to do this. Now everybody's doing this. Now even, you know, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, you know, Hulu, they're all doing original TV programming. But at the time, HBO was the only company in the world doing original programming, other than the kind of the broadcast stations like ABC, NBC, and CBS. So, so I said, you're so good at original TV programming. Why don't we do original web programming because the web might end up being a bigger medium than television, which is, of course, is what ended up happening. And so they said, sure, just do whatever you want. We don't even care. And uh, so I started doing this original web series called 3 a.m., which was I was always curious, what are people up to at three in the morning in New York City? What what are you know? And of course, they're up to nothing good, particularly on like not like on a Saturday night where everybody's sort of out going to a party or whatever. But like on a Wednesday night, if you're out at three in the morning, you're you're up to something and it's probably not good. So I would go out and this like this for three years. I would go out and just interview essentially prostitutes, drug dealers, homeless people, criminals, anybody I could find at three in the morning on a Wednesday night. And then I would um, uh, transcribe the interviews, design around them and put up four interviews a week that I did from like 1996 through 1998. And then eventually during this, I pitched Sheila Nevins, who was the head of documentaries and family programming for uh, HBO. I pitched her on the idea of doing it as a TV show. She said, sure, let's do it. She gave me money to shoot a pilot. I shot a pilot. Uh, it was about 45 minutes. Uh, and then ultimately she didn't, she didn't air it, even though I was still doing the, the web series for HBO and I continued doing it. She didn't air the pilot because she said – and, you know, mind you, this is the head of HBO's family programming department. She said, uh, you know, for a show like this, we need, either need to see um, you caching footage of uh, someone fucking their mother or we need to see your neighbors fucking. <laughs> and uh, 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 so so it didn't air. But um, but it was fun doing it. And, you know, I pitched other shows to HBO as well. And as you know, it, you have to pitch like lots of shows to, to get one going and everyone is all happy and loves you for a long time. And then you realize they're just saying that and you have to keep going and it's persistence. But ultimately, rather than continuing pitching TV shows, I ended up starting uh, a business creating uh, websites for entertainment companies, which was kind of more my skill set. So, you know, James, it's it's funny because, you know, with TV the way it is right now, I think a show like 3 a.m. would be a hit. I, I really do because, you know, everybody, every network now, every time I, I talk to an agent, a manager, etc., they're all looking for TV pilots over everything else. Yeah, I think there's so much opportunity out there in TV right now that uh, it's almost... Like it's crazy. Like there's so much original programming, and then there's so many reality shows, and there's so many channels for reality shows. Um, it's I think we're in a whole new world now for 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 quality TV. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, a, I mean, Game of Thrones is amazing. Again, another HBO show. Uh, yeah. Everyone tells me to watch Westworld. I haven't watched that yet. Uh, oh my but- god, well, Westworld's a great example. A, it's an HBO show, and not to go on about HBO, but B. I, I just noticed that, um, you know, Charles Yu, who's a great uh, science fiction author, is a, uh, a story editor on Westworld. And, and Ed Brubaker, who's been one of my favorite comic book writers for 20 years, he actually wrote an episode of Westworld. So it kind of shows you that all the talent, all the best talent in the world from other media are moving towards TV. It's why you see, like, you know, 
Kevin Spacey stars in Westworld or Woody Allen does an Amazon uh, – sorry, stars in House of Cards or Woody Allen does an Amazon show or Brian Koppelman who wrote – uh, Rounders and Oceans 13. He's doing the TV show Billions. So all the all this great TV talent is also moving into the movie space. Like uh, Stranger Things has uh, Winona Ryder and Matthew Modine, two movie stars, uh, being a star on a you know ten episode TV show on Netflix. Yeah, and, and Netflix also. I mean, that's another opportunity. You know, we're, we're, as we talk about opportunities, you know, uh, you know, anytime I talk about my TV pilot, people always say, "Well, have you tried Netflix? Have you tried Hulu? Have you tried uh, Amazon?" And I always say, "I haven't tried those those avenues yet because I want to have even more stuff to pitch." Because, like you like you just said, James, you have to have a ton of ideas to pitch, and they'll probably take one at you know at most. Yeah, and you know, Netflix is a company. That's committed uh, uh, six and a half billion dollars to buy original programming. That dwarfs every other company, like including HBO. One thing I want to add, um, but the, uh, one more last thing about HBO that's very interesting is that if you look at all these uh, companies that are doing original programming, starting from the very first one after HBO Showtime, but then moving to you know Bravo and now Netflix, Amazon, and so on. There's always someone from HBO who who originally worked at HBO who is involved in the original program and all these other networks and websites and channels and everything. I think you know you have these like hotbeds of ta- people say you're the average of the people you spend your most time with, and you have these hotbeds of talent, and they they create uh, you know essentially the people and the talent that get spread out to create entire industries. That's why you see things like the homebrew club of the 1970s. Who came out of that? Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, the founder of, you know, Osborne Computer, Compact, like all these like founders of the original computer companies came out of this one little kind of nerdy club in San Francisco um, that, that spawned all this talent. So, you, so whatever it is that you're interested in and passionate about, you kind of have to find, you know, where that that homebrew club is and basically spend time with those people and you'll rise up with them. I was talking to a guy yesterday uh, who is an astronaut. He flew in the space shuttle twice and he was talking about how 20 years earlier, uh, you know, there were 10 people in his lab at MIT. He was a, he was a student there. Three of them became astronauts. And so Again, if he was just hanging out at some random bar, you could never say three of these people at this bar became, you know, flew in outer space. But he found the place where he wanted to be an astronaut and he found the place where these were the where all the future astronauts were. Yeah, you know, we talk about you know, spending, you know, you are the average of all the people you spend time with. Uh, you know, that's why also about podcasting, you know, you get to spend time with all these, you know, different people. Uh, because, you know, again, you spend a lot of time with Brian Koppelman. And every time, you know, I, I was actually uh, just listening to the interview you did with him. And, you know, it, you two together are amazing because it's always about creativity and writing. And it's always, you know, about, you know, discovering new things, always pushing boundaries with yourself. Uh, you know, and again, I, I think that's just amazing. That's another sort of uh, avenue that podcast actually helps people with is this sort of discovering those new ideas and, and finding out, you know, maybe I should you know spend time with people who, who like this instead of the one I am right now. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's so important, like all, you know, it, this is where like, it's so important to, to say no to all the things that aren't good for you. Like to, 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 to really, you know, each person has to blaze their own path and that path is kind of carved out with your yeses. Uh, but if you say too many yeses, if you don't say the right yes, uh, then you won't find the people you need. You won't find the places you need. You don't. You won't find the knowledge you need. And it's very unique to you um, to to choose to. I hate to say the phrase "choose yourself" over and over again. It's very unique to you to basically choose the right things that are good for you. When so many other people need other things from you, like Dave, do this. Dave, do that. Dave, why are you wasting your time doing this? Everyone's got their opinion on what Dave should do, but you've got to carve out what what Dave should do. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. And, and you know, I, I want to talk about Choose Yourself, too. I, I Again, that is a phenomenal name for a book. And uh, on episode 99 of this podcast, I had on Morgan J. Freeman. Um, Morgan has an amazing story. Uh, absolutely amazing. And uh, basically, 
to give you a concise sort of a, a version of it, James, he basically he won Sundance. He was he was an award winning Sundance director, and he partied it all away. And he ends up now. Now he's working for MTV. Uh, he's been very, very, you know, open about it. But he had a phrase called "green light yourself," and he said, if you have a film project that you want to do, and he said, you know, no matter what it is, he goes, don't ask anybody for permission. Green light yourself and just go do the thing. And it reminds me a lot of of choose yourself. You know, give yourself permission to succeed. Give yourself permission to do these things. Well, I'll, gi- I'll give you two examples. One time, a friend of mine. Um, who was very familiar with YouTube. He, he worked for a YouTube advertising network, so he literally was behind the, the, the making of millions for many YouTubers. He was telling me he wants to create his own YouTube channel. And I said, well, and he had all these great ideas. And I said, well, what's stopping you? And he said, well, I don't have the, the camera equipment yet. And he said, I'm saving up for it. And I, and I picked up his iPhone and I said, what are you talking about? This The video camera in this iPhone is is much better than cameras from... 15, 20 years ago, the entire movies were shot on. So, you know, you, that's just an excuse. Like, just use this camera. Like, you take Michelle Phan, who who now has a, a $30 million, you know, cosmetics company. She started making YouTube videos. Her, her first 64 videos were horrible. And then she did one video that, w- that went viral. And using the ads off that, she, she finally bought some decent camera equipment and is, and is now built an empire. You kind of just have to go out and do like our, our comfort zone is papered, but completely papered, layer, six layers deep by our excuses. And you kind of have to just punch through that and just start doing. You know, the the um, the other example I have is a well-known one, Robert Rodriguez with um, El Mariachi. You, you, I'm sure you know the movie. He, he shot it with just eight an $8,000 budget. And what he did was he made a list of, uh, and it's like, famously called now the Robert Rodriguez list, uh, he, he made a list of just all the things he had access to, like his brother, his cousin's brother's uh, uh, trailer, his fire hose, his whatever. And, you know, just with all, he said, I'm going to make a movie using all of these things. And he made a movie on a tiny budget and then it became, it made him millions of dollars and it became this huge hit and won prizes at Sundance and everything. And now he's like a well-known uh, director and writer. Yeah, when I was making my own student film, um, I, cause I, I didn't go to college for film. I went for business. And uh, so, I, you know, <laughs> while I was make, going to college for business, I was, you know, making movies and stuff. And I made a movie. And the one thing that I made, I made it with one, a $99 digital camcorder that at the time was like amazing. And um, this was back in around 2008, I believe, or two, yeah, 2008. And I had the book uh, Rebel Without a Crew by Robert Rodriguez because he talks about making El Mariachi. Okay. And uh, oh yeah, it's an absolutely phenomenal book. A- absolutely phenomenal it, it, because you can't beat that empirical, uh, you know, uh, discussion because you know it's all nothing, no theory whatsoever. There's no theory. It's all about this is exactly what I did. This is the nuts and bolts. And the other book was Make Your Own Damn Movie by Lloyd Kaufman, and it was just those two books together taught me more than I. I I mean, I couldn't imagine a better film school than those two books. But uh, hopefully, this podcast is a good film school as well. But uh, but you know, but yeah, I, I agree, man. I, I agree, agree, James. It's just going out there and making something for even like like um, the the Duplass brothers even say, you know, make a movie for a hundred bucks uh, this weekend, a short film for a hundred bucks. You're not wasting a ton of money. And it teaches you how to actually make a film before you start getting those bigger budgets, and you, so that way you don't make all these expensive mistakes. That, that's amazing. I didn't know that about the Duplass brothers. They're, they're kind of intriguing me more and more because, I mean, I, f- I forget the name of w- which brother, but I see him in TV shows all the time, and he's just he's just really funny and brilliant. But uh, but then I realized they were they were actually making shows and, and movies. Um, what what were some what's some stuff that they've made recently that that I've liked? I, I forget. <laughs> well, uh, the the one I, I think you're referring to, I think was Jay. Uh, he's been on the League. Um, you know. Oh, yeah. The league and 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 Mindy. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, they actually have a. I think they have a deal with Netflix. I might be mistaken, but there's actually uh, two movies that uh, they've made for Netflix. One is kind of like a time travel movie. Uh, basically, they they sort of go to this like cottage, uh, and then it, there's a guest house in the back. You, they and whenever they go into this guest house, they they get the optimal idea of their of their spouse. So it, so it's it's um. 
I think it's Jay or Mark is the is the is uh, the husband, and I forget who his wife is. But whenever they go into this guest house by themselves, they see the optimal version of their of their spouse. So they're now it kind of plays out which which one do you want more? And there was another one. Um, I forget the name of it, but but. Uh, they play a version of a, of a psychopath who lures people, you know, off the internet, and then they sort of, you know, uh, he sort of tells them, you know, makes stuff up, and then you know this person's trying to sort of figure out, you know, what's true and what's not. It's really good, but uh, but yeah, yeah, they're absolutely phenomenal. And if you could ever give them for the podcast, James, I'm sure they would be phenomenal guests. Oh yeah, and they did um, togetherness on HBO, which I really liked. Oh yeah, yeah, togetherness. That's right. I forgot all about that show. Um, I actually that haven't was, seen that. That was a great show. I, I loved it. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that yet. It's again, it's on my list of things to watch. Because uh, I, 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 when I when it got canceled, everyone said how great it was, and I, I was like, you know what? I'll add to the list of things to watch. You know, but that's such an interesting thing that. Um, so yeah, it got canceled. And by the way, it got it had Amanda Peet. It had. Um, had some guy who was a, a famous actor. I forget his name. It had the Duplass brothers who have, who have been so successful. Um, and yet it's still still network executives cancel things. So it's almost like it's, it's like it's like a case study in how you can't be disappointed. You have to do what you can. You have to keep pushing forward. You can't give up. Louis C.K. is a great example. Uh, he had Lucky Louie on HBO. He had other sitcoms. You know, that was canceled. He had other sitcoms canceled. And then finally, he has this little tiny TV show on FX, uh, which becomes this huge, huge hit for him. No one would have guessed. They didn't even they barely wanted him to do the show. They gave him the lowest budget possible, became this huge hit after so many cancellations, after so many disappointments. I mean, he made a movie that was just the worst movie in history, according to the reviewers. And he never gave up. And now, I mean, I just watched him live in Madison Square Garden. He sold out Madison Square Garden five times this year. And just a, a phenomenal e- exhibition of what uh, persistence can do. And, and so, you know, James, as we, you know, we talk about persistence, you know, I, I, there was an interview you did for your podcast, the James Altucher show, and you had on a guest and I think it was, um, I forget his name, but, but you were talking about tight feedback loops and you were talking about, you know, this is how you get better was basically, you know, a mentor would help you out with this, but because they're already doing that tight feedback loop and you know exactly where you're going wrong, uh, you know exactly where you're going right and you can sort of, you know, break this out sort of like a big puzzle like you know okay I, i'm terrible at this so i should get better and i slowly build it up there was a there's a book um uh, i forget the guy uh by john waitson i think his name is but yeah but he, john waitson, and the art of learning yeah yeah and and he had a, a really great analogy because again you're a big chess guy where he would start off with just the king and then he had to, you know then then his uh his mentor would say okay now you're going to use a king and a bishop and then a king and a rook and etc cetera, etc cetera, so he could focus and not get lost in the chaos so what i'm trying to say with all this is do you think that you know louis ck and all these people like brian Koppelman too do you think that they always had that tight feedback loop and they always were just sort of not not just trying to work harder but they were also trying to work smarter too if you know what i mean Absolutely. So, so uh, let me go down two different angles with this. So one is, and I, I write about this, and in, in, so I write about all these people in my book, um, uh, Reinvent Yourself, which is coming out January fifth, about uh, essentially how we're all in a constant state of reinvention, and you know we all need, we're all trying to get to the next level of creativity. We're all trying to kind of move forwards and figure out what does it mean for our lives to have meaning, and, and so on. So, but I talk about this concept of uh, plus equal minus. So you want to find a plus, which is both a real and virtual mentor. So like in Josh Waitzkin's case, he mentions how he had a mentor. He had a a chess professional teaching him. Then you want to find your equals. So people you could play who are roughly your level or people who could challenge you, whether no matter what your career is, who are roughly your level, who who challenge you back and forwards. And that's how you get um, feedback is you get, uh, you know, challenged by your equals and then your mentor can kind of analyze how you responded to it. And then a minus. So someone you can teach and because that solidifies learning and also the people you're teaching will challenge you too. they'll ask you questions that you don't necessarily know the right answer to. So plus minus equal. And, uh, you know, in, in, in chess is a great example or tennis or any sport. Like, let's just take tennis, you know, uh, you, you're playing against an equal, and let's say your serve you, it doesn't go well for five serves in a row. Well, your mentor can tell you what you're doing wrong, 
And then, of course, when you're teaching a serve, you, you'll understand much better the mechanics of what a serve is as you're teaching. And so that's a great example where plus minus equal will make you a, best, a better tennis player. Yeah, and, and it's one of the, another thing that I, I found out too is uh, I, there was a book I was reading where they were talking about the discuss the uh, the point of of uh, the psychology of small wins. So you build up momentum and confidence because what you're doing is even these tiny little victories you sort of string them together, and now suddenly you feel you're feeling better, and your confidence and your skill is doing a lot more than say if you just try to tackle this problem all at once. You know, you so when you break it down and you you're winning those little mini battles, it, it does a lot more for your confidence. Yeah, I mean, I think the book you're referring to is uh, Little Bets by Peter Sims, and in there he t- discusses um, Chris, the very first chapter is Chris Rock. Uh, will build up a new act. You know, he, he'll spend like a year creating an act that he'll then, you know, eventually be an HBO special. But he doesn't just sort of like write that act and then, you know, risk everything in one HBO special. He'll go to the Laugh Factory in, in New Brunswick and he'll have just like notes on a napkin. He'll read straight off the napkin. He won't even do his whole kind of Chris Rock thing. He'll just sort of read straight off his napkin. And if it gets a few chuckles, if he'll note the one the jokes that got some chuckles, and he'll start working on them and crafting an act around them. He'll really kind of test stuff out with uh, these little bets, these little experiments. Yeah, and, and I think that's what you know. Again, when we're talking about reinventing ourselves, and also with writing, so I, I want to talk to you about you know your writing, and um, you know that's something that we. we sort of these little these little changes you know what i mean like these little these little things that can make you have more confidence and make you and, and sort of let you also propel you forward with that momentum uh because you know sometimes when people are are outlining something or staring at that blank page they sort of freeze up or they or they start writing and and i mean we've all been there james you start writing and you go oh god this is this is just terrible this sucks who the hell is going to want to read this stuff and then you just sort of throw it away and then you keep starting this process over and over again but I think if you you know our perception of how we write is also a big a big factor in this, and which is, again comes from changing our perception, so we're allowed to actually you know uh, have these small wins. Yeah, no, I I agree. And look, writing uh, writing is a very good way for me to find uh, these small wins. I, I write every single day. I've been writing every single day for for twenty five years, uh, and much of that time I've been publishing every single day, and. Uh, Look, when you not every not every writer does that, by the way, but but I do. And uh, when you publish every single day, you have a chance to see, oh, do people like this? Do people not like that? And that doesn't necessarily make you a, a better writer. Like it's not always like you're catering to public opinion, but you know you just use it as one component among many on the feedback you're getting to your writing. So as we talk about, you know, your writing, James, so what does, do you have the same routine every morning, meaning like you get up at a certain time, then you sort of, you know, you're going to have a cup of coffee and start writing or is every day sort of different for you? I think, I think, uh, most days or, or let's say more than 50% of the days are, I wake up, I have coffee, I read, I write, I always read before I write, but, um, but you know, some days are different. Uh, and I, I don't like to have any one routine because, it's important to mix things up uh, so that, you know, basically a, a soup with just hot water in it is kind of boring. You have to have lots of different ingredients. So I like to have lots of different ingredients in my day. And and if you just eat the same ingredients every day, you'll get bored. So and, and you'll even forget that you're eating. Your, your taste buds won't congratulate you anymore. So so you want to have different ingredients make up every each day so that, you know, your, your creativity is at, is at its heights. Now, other people do the exact same thing every single morning um, in order to keep doing things, but I, I don't like to do that. I, it's sort of like if you drive the same route every day. Sometimes you get to the destination and you can't even remember how you got there. You can't even remember driving because you were sort of daydreaming the whole way. Um, if you do something different, if you don't commoditize kind of your 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 habits that you do your, or, or your routine – then you'll you'll be much more aware of everything that's happening around you, and I think that's very important. So, so James, what does your writing you know uh, method look like? I mean, do you do you sort of outline exactly every article? I mean, I imagine you have to outline every book, but I mean, when you're writing sort of you know articles, do you outline what exactly it's going to be, and do you just sort of try to get it out as fast as you can? No, I don't necessarily outline. I mean, sometimes uh, there's a rough outline, like let's say. 
I interview Barack Obama or whoever, and I'll say 10 things Barack Obama told me. So that's kind of makes up a rough sketch of things. But then storytelling, I don't really outline so much. Like I just let that kind of come out. Like I'll, I'll, I'll kind of just start with the first line, like, you know, and, and then this was the time I, I stole money from my mother and, and I'll just let the star story kind of unravel itself from there. Yeah. You know, uh, one thing I've learned is that if you do think too much and, and you do, you know, outline too much, it's a way of, of you think you're doing something, but it's just a way of it, it but it really is just keeping you busy and you're not actually getting anywhere. Uh, you know what I mean? And you, you just sort of keep, you know, outlining, going back, revising the outline, and then you're on a third version of the outline, but you, you're never actually doing anything. It's so important. I realized just even this year, how important to actually just, just thrusting yourself into the work. You know, if it's a screenplay, open up final draft or fade in and just start writing it. And sort of letting it fall as it may, if you know what I mean, James. Yeah, you you have to just keep doing. That's the important thing. Yeah, it's um, it, you know, I was reading Ryan Holiday's book uh, about uh, the obstacle is the way, and uh, you know, one of one of some of the things that he was saying in there were just really amazing about how the obstacle is really the way. Uh, your perception of the obstacle is is very key because if you view it as a, a, a way to gain a further advantage. It doesn't look like an obstacle anymore, and um, the impediment to action leads to more action itself. Uh, like uh, Marcus Aurelius said, and again, just changing that small perception has such a huge uh, advantage as you're trying to sort of do do your work, whether it be writing or solving you know, an IT problem or you know building a website or what have you. I mean, you can just see how that sort of ties in through everyday life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Look, I had, um, I, I, all of us have obstacles all the time in what we want to do. So, so, you know, one that I spoke about earlier was, you know, HBO rejected uh, a couple of TV show ideas I had, even when they had expressed interest. Okay, no problem. Uh, that's when I sort of said, okay, you know, you always have to say, well, in what way will this work out the best for me? And what I ended up doing was starting a company rather than doing a TV show. Um, you know, another thing, you know, sometimes you have, arguments with partners and you could um you can like if, if a partner turns out to be not so good for you, you, you there's no point in like explaining to him how he or she is wrong or no good for you anymore you, you, what you do is you end up finding another partner to buy out the old partner or you end up starting a new business like the, what I tend to do is I tend to lean into the problem and say okay this is a problem or an obstacle how can this work rather than trying to fight the obstacle how can this work out the best for me in some other alternative way. And, and you know, uh, this sort of ties in also because, you know, uh, in Choose Yourself, as we sort of go back to that book, um, which I'm going to link to in the show notes, everybody, because that book is absolutely phenomenal. You know, you talk about making an, an idea list, and that really pushes the boundaries of your creativity. So whatever, you know, your, your idea list, the subject is going to be, you know, making these 10 ideas makes you sort of broaden your horizon, broaden your perspective. Um, so, you know, in, in fact, James, do you want to, you know, maybe just talk about idea lists just for those of you, for those out there who, who've never maybe not read Choose Yourself? You know, I, I think it's, you know, I don't want to, I don't want <laughs> to say it because, um, but I, cause I, I mean, you're the, you're the man who, who created this. And I, I just wanted to ask, you know, do you want to talk about idea lists for a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it kind of <laughs> came out of a time when I was just had no ideas and no creativity and I was dead broke. And I needed to – I had two kids and I needed to make something of my life or at least make sure I didn't go broke and, and die. Like I was kind of suicidal. Like I was spending tons of money and uh, I had already had sold a company but then like blew all the money and, and gone broke. And I just needed to, to, to try things. But, but everything I was trying was just failing and it's because I wasn't having any good ideas. And I realized, you know what? My creativity right now is pretty weak. Like I'm not doing anything to improve my creativity. And the creativity muscle or the idea muscle is just like any other muscle really. Like if you don't walk for two or three weeks, like let's say you were in a coma for some reason and you were in bed for two weeks, you actually need physical therapy to walk again because your leg muscles atrophy so quickly. So it's the same thing with the idea muscle. And so what I do to exercise the idea muscle is I'll write down – 10 ideas a day and doesn't have to be good ideas. In fact, 
you can't they can't be good ideas. Most of your ideas are really bad. Uh, you can't come up with three thousand six hundred fifty good ideas a year. And so I'll come up with all sorts of ideas, like I don't know, ideas of where I'm going to take my kids over a Christmas vacation that they've never been before, or ideas for businesses I could start, or ideas for virtual realities I'd create, or ideas for Airbnb to be a better company, or ideas for Uber to be a better company. And I'll just come up with ideas for other people, I'll, ideas for Dave Bullis, guests, guests I could introduce him to for his podcast. You know, I'll just come up with ideas for anything. And then gradually what happens is, and I noticed this very quickly, between three and six months, you'll start to really feel like an idea machine. And it just keeps getting better and better until your creativity is at an enormous height compared to where you were before and maybe even compared to other people. And it just really works. It works for anything. Like, like if I want to meet somebody, I'll come up with 10 ideas for them. And in, invariably, there might be, if I do enough research and work, there'll, there'll be one, at least one good idea for that person. And uh, eventually, I'll be able to arrange a meeting. Or, or, you know, I run a business. So if I'm coming up with 10 ideas for my business, invariably, there's a good idea in there that will make my business more money. And so, you know, I, this is a very important topic to improve creativity, improve your idea ability, and improve your ability to make money improve your ability to, to network and, and help other people make money and so on. You know, one thing I did with the I idealist, James, was I would share it uh, on my Instagram particularly. And what I started doing was for a whole week, I was coming up with 10 different movie concepts. And just I love that. Well, thank you, James. And I, 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 I tagged you a couple of times in some of them. Uh, I stopped because I was like, James is going to get pissed off. And like Dave Bullis tagging me again. Uh, so what I did was... Oh, I uh, get pissed off about that. <laughs> I uh, so like people were responding to it. They were like, "Hey, where are you? You know, why are you doing this? Where did you get this from?" And I and I would always say, you know, buy, choose yourself. It's ninety nine cents on Amazon, uh, you know. And I I would say, you know, for the Kindle version, and I, I would just say, you know, the you know these are concepts that I would. Any the best ones I would actually turn into a log line, and then from the log lines, uh, the best log lines, see what I would do in terms of actually making a screenplay. Well, there was one I came up with that I actually really, really liked, and I ended up turning that into a screenplay. And I'm going to go back, and I'm, it definitely needs a couple more drafts, but I was blown away that it just came out of almost almost nowhere because I was just writing, 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 trying to be, you know, keep my brain out of it as much as possible and just focus on the subconscious and let that flow, you know, that flow state that, that writers always talk about, and just getting there and making it seem that, you know, where, where you can actually just keep writing without actually thinking. It's kind of like what Ray Bradbury says. Don't think while you're writing, feel while you're writing. So so what's the screenplay about? Uh, it, it's a story about five kids who are trapped in a treehouse uh, and, and with a monster down at, at the base of the sort of this treehouse. So they can't get out and they're basically stuck during the snowstorm in this treehouse with this sort of uh, unseen monster creature force down there that's sort of stalking this treehouse. That's neat. And what, what are you going to do with it? Well, once I uh, polish up the drafts, I'm actually going to send it out to a few contests. And if it, if it never goes anywhere, uh, then I would probably end up shooting it myself. Cool. That sounds great. And, and, you know, I actually want to ask you too, James, you know, as we talk about, you know, uh, you know, creativity and writing, is there any sort of, you know, film ideas or TV ideas that you have right now that you're, that you wanted to, you know, either talk about, uh, or even just that you maybe are going to pitch at some point, or maybe there's just ideas floating in your head for, for different movies and shows. You know, it's funny. Um, there was a recent article about me in the New York times and it kind of went into what I, about my minimalism philosophy and afterwards, a couple of television companies called me, some really big, well-known ones that you would know of, and uh, asked me for ideas. But I'm not sure I really want to put in the hard work for a TV show. Like right now, my, my podcast uh, has a very big audience. It's, I almost say it's like my podcast audience is the same as like a bad cable TV show audience in the sense that in terms of the numbers, and uh, uh, which is good. It's growing you know, I feel that podcast audience is growing, so it's only going to continue to grow. And um, I've really decided I'm gonna I'm gonna double down on on the podcast and and focus on making that as as good as it could possibly be. Although I am working on fiction right now. 
you know, what if you, here's just an idea. What if you actually started like a podcast sort of series, almost like um, Serial was, where they had sort of like a pod, it's almost like an old timey radio show. And basically, you know, it, it's a radio play, you know, and, and I, I've, I've thought, of this, thought of this myself, you know, if you ever have an idea that's more like an, like, like that's more suited towards audio, you know, podcasting is a great way to release it because again, no, there's no more gatekeepers or barriers to entry. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've been thinking of exactly that. Like, so in addition to doing the interview show, which I always do and I always, and I won't stop and I love interviewing, you know, people and everything, um, doing kind of like mini series, uh, uh, alongside of it within the same show, within the context of the James Altucher show. Yeah. And, and your podcast numbers, by the way, uh, I mean, you probably get, you know, a hundred times what I get, but, um, I mean, I, y- your podcast is one of the best podcasts out there. Uh, because oh, thank you. the questions you ask and the guests that you get, I mean, that that's important because it's not just about the guests you get. It's also the questions and what you're talking about. I've always learned something every episode of your, of your podcast. Well, you know, and as you know, it's really not, I mean, look, guests are having kind of guests that people recognize is part of it because then, you know, that, that helps with downloads, but ultimately you have to bring the job home, uh, with, with the questions and the preparation as as you know, and, and, and everything. And that's what really, uh, drives the podcast. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, James, I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you're extremely busy. I had some Twitter oh, no, questions. I've been enjoying this. Thank you so much, Dave, for, for having me on. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I, I appreciate you coming on, James. I really do. And, uh, I, you know, I had some Twitter questions come in. Do you, do you mind answering a few questions? Sure. So the first question uh, comes from uh, Martin Tiller. And Martin wants to know, how long have you been doing the 10 ideas a day? Since 2002. And this kind of ties in what we were just talking about. Uh, it's, it's Martin again. He wants to, the question is, how much time do you put into researching your guests for the podcast? Oh, my God. I put in so much time. Like, you know, so last week uh, was Stephen Pressfield was on my podcast. I probably read I read 10 or no, maybe 11 books by him, 11, and took notes on each one, came up with questions about each one. Watched two interviews he did, one with Oprah and one with Marie Forleo. Um, I I tried to find other interviews he did, but he doesn't really do many interviews, not in the past, like, five years. And, uh, you know, I watched the movie The Legend of Bagger Vance, which he wasn't as involved in, but I still wanted to to watch it. Uh, I've done – I read more about the history of, you know, the the 300, which he writes about in the novel Gates of Fire – I mean, I probably prepared maybe 40 or 50 or hours for that for, for, you know, a one or two hour interview. And I, I flew to I live in New York City, but I flew to L.A. and drove to Malibu uh, to interview him. And because I wanted to do it in person because uh, I, I admire so much his, his books. And but that's like an example of what of what I do. I'm, I'm preparing an interview right now with somebody who, who's uh, uh an expert in nutrition that I really admire. And, you know, he lives in a southwestern state and I'm planning on flying to visit him, doing a ton of research. And I just, I put my all into, into these things. Yeah, I, I know what you mean about Stephen Pressfield not wanting to do uh, or, or doesn't do a lot of interviews. I, I've actually tried to get him a lot uh, to, to come on this podcast, and each time he, he politely declines. Uh, but, like, you know, The War of Art is an absolute essential read. If you're going to be an artist, no matter if you're going to write, paint, make movies, whatever, The Art of War is required reading. Yeah, no, uh, War of Art and its companion piece, uh, Turning Pro, are just brilliant. Like they're they're very good. And you know his his novel, uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance, is very good. Gates of Fire is very good. And then he has a new novel, which is kind of almost a, a a fictional version of the War of Art, which is called The Knowledge, which is about what he was going through to battle his own resistance in the 1970s. And uh, it's a great book. So he. You know, he's very interesting. He's very a big inspiration for, for writers and creatives. Yeah, absolutely. I actually had his editor on, uh, Sean Coyne. And it's funny because I actually won. Um, I, do you know who Robert McKee is? Yeah, yeah, of course. He wrote Dialogue and... Um, uh, Story. 
story. Yeah. yeah. So I, I actually won um, first place in, in his in a writing competition that he had, and I got to and one of my and my prize was to go to New York to take his his four or three day seminar uh, uh, story, and it's basically the whole book. And uh, it's funny because. Sean Coyne is also his editor. So when I went up to, uh, afterwards, uh, as the the seminar ended, I said, you know, hi Bob. You know, we have a mutual friend, Sean Coyne, and and he goes, oh well, how about that? You know, and uh, but I, I wanted to bring McKee up because I think he'd be a great guest on your podcast, James. Yeah, I think he would be also. Like, uh, you know, I'm 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 interested in him. He's he's a fascinating guy. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Uh, the story seminar was actually really good. I actually what did I, you learn? Uh, what I learned, I learned about the principles of of, of story. And again, uh, you know, I, what I did was I, I made a deal with myself. You know, I, I realized you have to sort of make deals with yourself sometimes. And my whole thing was I bought a whole pack of pens, brand new, my favorite pen in the world, the Pilot V7s. And I just, everything he said I wrote, I would not stop writing for anything. So even if I already knew it, I, it doesn't matter. You just keep writing. And by the end, I had so many notes that I could now go back and dissect story. And I could also, uh, I, I found supplementary notes. Even before I went to the, to the seminar in New York, uh, James, I actually listened to every podcast, every video interview he did, uh, found any crib notes I could of, of the actual seminar. And I put them all together in this sort of like big binder slash file. That way I was so prepared for this that, you know, I was hoping to come out and just be, you know, an absolute genius of story by the end of it. And and were you? Um, yeah, I, I actually I would say that I definitely had more confidence in myself going out. What what would like help me out? Like, what would be like the main thing that you learn? Like, what's what makes a great story? Telling the truth. What does that mean? Be be specific. So, telling the truth it doesn't mean the facts of what happened. It's the why of why they happened, and. When you get down even deeper than that, there's two things to, that you have to focus on. The philosophers of the world either thought that you were being or becoming. So basically, they thought that everything is in constant flux or everything is not in flux. It's just always the same. It just appears that it's in flux. And he talked about all the philosophers throughout time, with what side they stood on. You're either being or becoming, being or becoming. And he said, as you write your story, you have to make a decision about which one you think it is. And the principles of that will guide your story throughout. So if you think that everything is in flux, well, then, you know, then nothing, nothing ever stays the same. You can't, you know, it's kind of like what Heraclitus said. You can never step into the same river even once because it doesn't exist at all. Or you're on the other side where you think that it's always being, it's always the same. And these principles are going to stay throughout. So it's kind of like you have to make that decision and that guides your story throughout. Okay. I like that. That's interesting. I'm gonna. I, I have to read story. I, I I know that's like the key book for uh for screenwriting. So I want to read it. Yeah, there's always like there's three books that everyone talks about for screenwriting. Uh, story by McKee, uh, a screenplay by um by uh, Sidfield, and obviously Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Those are like the th if you could read even just one of three of those books, most screenwriters and most, you know, Hollywood producers, they sort of go back to those three books. There's actually uh, no, there's actually another, okay. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go re keep recommending. There was going to be another screenwriting book that I recommend that I think is the best one out there. Um, it's called the 90 day screenplay by Al Watt. That mm -hmm. is, that is the best book of screen of screenwriting I've ever seen. I never so, read. So here, here's, here's an idea I had for like a fun little uh, sitcom type TV series. So it's called Guru's Gone Wild, and it's uh, – instead of Girls Gone Wild, Guru's Gone Wild. <laughs> and it's basically um, – you know, I know a lot of people in kind of the self-help and personal improvement industry. And of course, all of us have our own share of problems, but many of these people kind of put forward this public face that's like perfect in order to kind of attract their, you know, whatever, their their people for their seminars or, or whatever. And – uh I was thinking it would just it would be like almost like this Seinfeld type thing where, you know, uh, the, the character based on me would meet with like the character based on whatever well-known uh, person. And then they would just be complaining about relationships the whole time and stories would kind of like veer off from there. And I just thought it would be like a, a funny idea and kind of like the Larry Sanders show meets uh, Seinfeld type of thing. But with <laughs> but with like the self-help industry. 
<laughs> and, and the self help self help industry is huge. And uh, I'm, by, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned the Larry Sanders show. I love that show. And uh, you know, he passed away earlier this year. And uh, I, I I hope more people actually find that show because I think it's a it's a gem, James. Well, well, think about the hotbed of talent. You know, we talked earlier about places you could go where a very small group becomes this amazing, amazingly talented group of people later on. So, of course, Gary Shandling already was was amazingly talented. But look who came from there. Bob Odenkirk was on the show. And, of course, he's, you know, well known for Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Uh, uh, Judd Apatow was a writer for the show. And, of course, he's made the, the funniest movies of, of all time ever since then. Uh, Jeffrey Tambor was on the show. And then, of course, he did Arrested Development. And now he does Transparent for for Amazon. Um, gosh, I was just reading about – oh, John Stewart – was mm-hmm. on the show and he went on to do the daily show. So it's just, it's nonstop. The talent, Janine Garofalo was on that show. Uh, it's just nonstop. The talent that was on that show almost, almost every week and, and the writers of the show and everything. Yeah, it's absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, you know, when you, when you can get those sort of hotbed of talent, uh, you know, it, it, then it becomes almost the, the opposite problem, which is how do you keep all that talent? Because, you know, at some point, you know, when somebody comes so talented in, the, in those those writer room, writing writers rooms <laughs> or, or something else, you know, they end up getting offers to leave. I mean, it happens a lot on late night. Uh, I, I have a friend of mine. He actually writes for uh, Jimmy Kimmel and he actually talked about the same thing. You know, it's a lot of the times you get a lot of offers and a lot of really cool things, because when you're when you're doing good work constantly, people come up to you to all, to make you more opportunities. Well, you know, John Stewart had a philosophy about this. I mean, the, the Daily Show is a great uh uh, kind of management uh, study because you, he created all this. He created this environment with all this amazing talent, also like Steve Carell, Stephen Colbert, Ed Helms, and all of those guys left. And John Stewart encouraged them to leave. I mean, John Stewart even helped develop Stephen Colbert's show, The Colbert Show. Um, and uh, why did he do that? Well, because he knew that you know talent needs to be needs to flourish. It needs to grow. It needs to go on to their own thing. But because of the high standards set by that talent, new good talent will come in and and take over, and that's what's hap- that, that's what happened. I mean, The Daily Show probably never had a year over year where it was worse one year than the year before. Yeah, and uh, you know, again, you know, as we talk about all the talent. You know that that that's always that idea too is having that farm system, always being able to pull and and recognize talent. Uh, it's kind of you know like a professional sports team does the same thing, right? They always are on the lookout, having scouts, making sure that they get the top guys over somebody else. And uh, but th- by the way, I do like that guru idea. Uh, you know, the, you know, as I'm thinking about it as I talk, that would actually be a, a, a funny show because again, the self help industry, James, is so huge. I mean, I used to go into Borders back when they existed, and now Barnes and Nobles, and there'd be a a, just a huge wall of self-help books. Also, you know, it's it's kind of like that Family Guy joke. Uh, Brian wrote a book called like uh, "Think It, Do It, Want It" or something like that, and it was yeah. you know most of it was blank pages, so you could fill it out yourself. That's funny. <laughs> uh, that's I'm sorry, James. That, that's great. That's, that's a funny idea. Yeah, it's just because, uh, you know, and then, and then he was on Bill Maher, uh, Brian the dog was, and he was like, you know, Brian isn't wanting it and wishing it the same thing. And why are most of the pages blank? He's like, isn't that lazy as hell? But, uh, but yeah, I think that a, a guru idea, it would be awesome, James, especially now. I think um, I think the self-help industry, I think it, it, it maybe started off in the right direction. But then, you know, as p- other people sort of get into it, it sort of. Uh, loses a lot of, I guess, uh, I don't know, I guess maybe a lot of, it sort of comes watered down, if you will. I mean, you can imagine like two, I mean, look, there's all these, look, getting real help requires hard work. It's not like I'm going to read an Instagram quote and suddenly be helped. Uh, But you can imagine these two guys who have like, you know, tons of followers or whatever on Instagram or Facebook or wherever they're meeting and like one of them sad because his latest quote or post didn't get as many likes another person might be like upset about like a girlfriend and you know it just kind of you know you kind of kind of see the real thing but meanwhile uh, the you know some side stories might be problems at a seminar or you know the you know how they come overcome their problems with the girlfriend or whatever like you know, there's, there could be many different sub stories in there. I probably should write like, uh, well, how, um, you know, it's like a page a minute, right, for a script. So if you write a 22 minute show, it's 22 pages, and you need 
what do you need? You need like three storylines intersecting and kind of a beginning, middle, and end for each one. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. asking you. I'm, I'm learning from you. <laughs> so, uh, so TV shows, depending upon which, what, like what kind of show it's going to be, the the way that the format works changes a little bit. Um, so, if you're writing something like Seinfeld, it's a lot different than something like. Um, let's say The Walking Dead, because if you're writing a one-hour show, you write it like a movie. If you're writing a, a half-hour sitcom, it's everything becomes like double-spaced, and it, and it looks almost more like a stage play, how that's laid out. Um, so if you're going to do like something like you know Seinfeld, I, Everyone Loves Raymond, the, it would actually be double what you think, because each page is at now 30 seconds instead of a minute. So uh, it would be for a 20-minute show, it becomes like 40 to 50 pages, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, that, so if you, uh, whatever software like if you use final draft fade in writers duet uh there's so many out there now you know it it does all the heavy lifting for you so you can focus on writing and that that's key what what so other than just the spacing and stuff what are the what are the beats of a sitcom so again you know there's uh so again like if we use seinfeld as an example seinfeld was revolutionary because all four main characters always had their own storyline. So Jerry had A, Kramer had BB, George C, Elaine D, and you know all of them would end up intersecting at some point or another throughout the show. And and what I love about Seinfeld was everything is is, is different. No no two episodes are ever the same. And I think that was the genius of Larry David um, because you know I actually knew a guy who wrote a couple of screenplays for Seinfeld, and it was Fred Stoller's his name. And oh, he yeah. actually. I'm on Facebook friends with Fred Stoller. He's a good guy. Yeah, I've tried to get him on the podcast, but we can't make our schedules sort of coincide. I'm going to keep trying, though. And, uh, you know, he, he would say whenever he would hand in a script, Larry David had to we always go through it, and he would add the final touches to it. And sometimes he would change a few things up here and there. But um, but basically, you know what? Yeah, exactly. You have a beginning, middle, and end. And, you know, the beginning and the end are 25% each, and that middle part is 50%. So that would, you know, at the end, you have 100%. And, you know, you, you sort of have these storylines. They can sort of intersect as they are, depending upon how you're going to write the story. So with Seinfeld, like I was just saying, it's a lot, you know, each episode was different. And then sometimes at the end, everything would sort of all intersect with, with each other. All four storylines would intersect. Um, you know, and then sometimes there would be only two storylines that would actually intersect. Uh, or sometimes there would only be two storylines, period. So that, that was a brilliance of Seinfeld. You never knew what, how actually the story was going to play out. And, uh that's why I think Seinfeld's still one of the best TV shows ever, if not the best TV show ever. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's probably a good model to to follow. He and I'm sure you're you're referring to he had he wrote an excellent book, uh, My Seinfeld Year, uh, where he writes about this stuff. Oh yeah, absolutely. I I, I think you know I, I actually bought the Kindle version, and uh, that's actually where I started saying to, to Fred, I said you should come on this podcast, and we can you know dig in a little deeper, talk about TV writing and how it's changed, if it even has changed. And uh, you know all that good stuff, but uh, but yeah, my Seinfeld year is a fantastic uh, ebook. Yeah, no, I um, I, I'm a fan of that one. Yeah, I, and- just, got, I just got Seinfeldia, uh, which is kind of a history of the Seinfeld show, and it's it looks interesting. Really, I haven't heard of that. Uh, it, so basically, is it like all about how it got developed and stuff? Yeah. See that? Yeah, I love stuff like that. It's very interesting. I actually have a book about Lost, uh, the TV show Lost, and it was the only one that Damon Lindelof actually signed off on, and I think he wrote the foreword for it as well, but it basically goes into the whole mythology of Lost. Oh, wow. Uh, what's the name of the book? You know, I'm, um, I don't have it right handy. It's actually buried in, in amongst my library of books. I'm gonna, I'll tell you what, I will, I will message it, uh, the title to you. Yeah, yeah, because I just finished um, rewatching Lost for probably the third time. I watched it with my fourteen-year-old. So did did she like it? Oh, she loved it. Yeah, it's a great show. I mean, a lot of people hate the ending, but I love it. I don't. I have no problem with it. I I thought it was a great show. Yeah, it, I think it was a phenomenal show. Uh, I, I spe- season one. I literally was always like, "What the hell is going on?" You know, it, it's but in, in a good way, not like you know in a bad way. And you would always be guessing about you know what the hell would are these things and how how this actually is and uh, you know. And then they actually started doing a podcast about it. I mean, this is you know a co- couple years ago when the show was still on the air. They would actually do podcasts about the episode and you know answer some fan questions. It was actually really interesting the way they did that. I think it actually helped out you know inter- interaction and also helped out you know the fan base uh, to make them you know to make them much more uh, inclusive. Yeah, no, uh, I I loved every aspect of it. So, but you're right. The first season was great, but I loved uh, I loved the last season too. I like the whole story of you know Jacob and the man in the bl- and black and so on. 
Yeah, it, it was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, I know a couple people who wrote a couple episodes of Lost. And I want to have them on the show, too, because they would explain to me how they actually wrote the episodes. And basically what they would do is, he said, uh, you know, either JJ or Damon would come in. And they would say, okay, this is what has to happen in this episode. And now, okay, this is your episode. Now, episode two, this is what has to happen. So this is your episode. So that's why a lot of times you would see things that would never actually explained. Because writers were just encouraged to use their creativity and come up with this stuff. But they didn't necessarily have to tie in with anything. Well, and, I, and I'm fine with that. Like, everybody wanted, like, very nice explanations for everything by the end. I'm okay if... Uh... You know, not everything in the world needs to be explained. Like, it's okay that not that you, that you can still use your imagination to understand what's happening. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree, James. And, uh, you know, that's why in the first episode, there was all these, you know, strange things going on. And I was, again, I was cool with them not explaining a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, James, again, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, I know you're a busy guy. So I just no, want to... really appreciate this, though. Oh, yeah, I, I, again, James, I, I, I've, one of the reasons I started the podcast was because of you. And it's amazing that we're, you know, you're, you're going to be episode like 141, I think. Um, but I just wanted to ask, you know, James, just, you know, is, in closing, is there anything that we didn't discuss that maybe you wanted to talk about or anything you wanted to say to sort of put a period at the end of this whole conversation? No, I mean, I'm really, uh, I, uh, it, it was a good conversation for me. I, I learned more about screenwriting, which is something I'm always interested in. I just want to mention if I'm going to be promotional at all, which I, which I don't like doing, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, I do have this book that I'm really happy with, uh, called choose your, uh, called reinvent yourself, which is coming out January 5th, 2017. And I'm super excited about it. And, you know, if people want to, uh, learn more about it and the stories that kind of inspired it, then, uh, then I would, I would get it. Uh, and everyone, I'm going to link to that in the show notes as well, uh, on, on Amazon and James, you can count on me buying a copy on day one. I'm going to buy it the minute it comes out. And, uh, you know, cause I, again, I have every single one of your books and I think they're all phenomenal. Oh, well, thanks so, so much. So I appreciate that. And James, where can people find you out online? Um, people can find me, uh, at jamesaltucher.com or at, uh, they, they, they can find me on Amazon or they can, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, Twitter at Jay Altucher, Instagram at Altucher, uh, there's all sorts of places. I'm everywhere. <laughs> and and uh, I'm going to link to all those in the show notes, everybody. You can always go to DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. Uh, I'm at, you know what, James, it's funny. I'm actually getting more into YouTube now. You know, I'm actually losing, you know, tw Twitter used to be fun. Facebook used to be fun. Instagram is still kind of fun, but YouTube now is getting to be like really fun for me. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but all these social media sites are so cyclical, but YouTube always seems to be the place where if you want to find something particular, you can usually find it. If you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's just, I don't know, Twitter, it's just like everything's getting bogged down and Facebook, forget about it, man. It's just, it's just, you know, you post something, hardly anybody ever sees it. It's just, it's just, you know, I just think it's redundant most of the time. Yeah, I, I agree. James, uh, again, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. And again, I, if you ever want to come back on, I, please, the door is always open and I wish you the best luck with everything. Excellent, Dave. Thanks so much and, and good luck with everything. Thank you very much, James. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yeah, again, uh, again, it was great talking to you, and uh, I wish again. Uh, let's talk soon, James. Okay. Thanks, Take care, Dave. buddy. Bye bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis dot com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.